Uh, thanks, Mike. I, as all of you know, variations in biliary anatomy are common, and they have practical significance for safe cholecystectomy. Uh, we are going to review uh, some of these variations. There we go. In uh, bile duct and arterial anatomy, and also point out some standard landmarks that are useful for orientation. Uh, we'll be using the term hepatocystic triangle. This is the area between the cystic duct and the gallbladder, the liver and the hepatic duct. This is the high-priced real estate where bile duct and vascular injuries occur. The size and the shape of this triangle will vary with retraction and during the course of dissection. Hepatocystic triangle is the preferred nomenclature rather than Kalos triangle, which is dependent upon the location of the cystic artery and which is neither consistently present nor anatomically precise as it's commonly used. So I want you to forget about Kalo if you can. About 50 to 60% of patients have what we call typical anatomy of the extra hepatic bile ducts where the right posterior sectional duct from segments six and seven joins up with the right anterior sectional duct from segments five and eight to form the right hepatic duct. And there it is, which joins the left hepatic duct to form the common hepatic duct. So right anterior sectional duct, right posterior sectional duct, right hepatic duct. The most common and the most important variation in the right ducts is when the anterior and posterior ducts do not join together. Instead, they each have their separate junction with either the common hepatic duct or even the left hepatic duct. So some version of this occurs in one out of four people. Uh, here are some cholangiographic examples of separate right-sided ducts. And what I want you to note is that when there is a separate right duct, the distance between where that duct inserts and the cystic duct can be quite variable. In fact, when the right posterior duct inserts separately, it tends to insert lower down on the common hepatic duct so that the distance between a cystic duct and a separate right posterior duct is less than the distance between the cystic duct and a separate right anterior duct on average. Uh, a low inserting right hepatic duct can also be very close to the gallbladder. And here is a relatively uh, dramatic example. A low posterior duct is vulnerable to injury. 2% of the time, one out of 50 cholecystectomies, the cystic duct will actually come from a separate right posterior duct. And again, here are some cholangiographic examples of that. And if this variation is not recognized, injury is an imminent risk. Uh, here's an interesting picture of a bile duct injury. Uh, the common hepatic duct has been resected. There was a separate right posterior duct in this case that somehow escaped injury. Another important variation in the ducts is the presence of a subvesical duct. This is a segmental or sometimes an accessory segmental duct that's underneath Glisson's capsule in the liver bed. These are common. They're present in up to one third of individuals. And in fact, this is the most common source of a post-operative bio leak from the liver bed. Obviously, the way to avoid this is to stay out of the liver if you can. Uh, the arrowheads here point out a subvesical duct. Uh, this is an area of extravasation from a subvesical duct on an intraoperative cholangiogram. This subvesical duct joins a right anterior duct as they commonly do. And once again, you can actually see that there are separate right anterior and posterior ducts. These subvesical ducts are not ducts of Lushka, nor did Lushka, Hubert von Lushka, the German anatomist, he did not all describe ducts going directly from the liver to the gallbladder. What Lushka described were two tubular structures in the wall of the gallbladder that are intramural glands and lymphatics. A true hepatical cholecystoducts from the liver to the gallbladder have been described, but they are quite rare, certainly more so than subvesical ducts, which are relatively common. The cystic duct can insert anywhere from the liver down to the periampulary region. 
An angular pattern with the common duct is considered typical, but the cystic duct can have a parallel course or a spiral course. In fact, if you look at cholangiographic studies, the textbook lateral entry is less common than either a medial or a posterior entry of the cystic duct. There are two variations in the cystic duct that are particularly dangerous for duct injury. The first is when the cystic duct is fused to the common duct for a variable distance. This is called the hidden cystic duct. This can occur natively because the two can share a common fibrous sheath, but commonly this is the result of inflammatory fusion. A parallel cystic duct can cross the common duct and it can go in front of it or behind it. The second high-risk situation is the so-called short cystic duct, and this is a result of inflammatory contraction, and it can essentially result in a cholecystocolidocal fistula. Now, surgeons will sometimes describe an absent cystic duct, but this appearance is almost certainly the result of an acquired inflammatory condition. Anatomic studies based on dissection have not actually demonstrated true absence of the cystic duct. The cystic artery uh, comes, is single about 75% of the time. It divides into a superficial or inferior and a deep and superior or superior branch. It comes from the right hepatic artery about 70% of the time. And the right hepatic artery goes behind the common duct about 85% of the time. So what this means is that we have anatomic diversity. One out of four people has multiple cystic arteries. One out of three people, the cystic artery comes from someplace other than the right hepatic artery. And in one out of 10 people, there is no cystic artery in the hepatocystic triangle. So okay, O does not exist. The cystic artery can branch at various distances from the actual gallbladder wall. There can be two cystic arteries, in which case the deep branch usually comes from the right hepatic, whereas the source of the superficial branch is variable. In the 30% of people where the cystic artery comes from some other place besides the right hepatic artery, it can come from a number of different vessels. And you can see in some of these arrangements, the cystic artery will be anterior to the common duct and anterior to the cystic duct, so that about 20% of people will have an anterior cystic artery. So if you put all the variations in the cystic artery together, the typical anatomy, meaning a single cystic artery, coming from the right hepatic and existing in the hepatocystic triangle, typical anatomy occurs in less than half the time. Uh, when you divide the cystic artery, it should always be at the wall of the gallbladder. Why? There's two reasons for this. One, to protect the right hepatic artery, which can be close. And number two, to avoid compromising either a branch of the artery to the liver or a recurrent branch to the common duct that come from the cystic artery on occasion. The right hepatic artery, 15% of the time, is anterior to the common hepatic duct. The right hepatic artery can be very closely applied to the gallbladder and adherent to it, and it, in fact, it can parallel the gallbladder for several centimeters before going north into the liver. Here's a case of mine from last week. You can see way over on the right that the uh, cystic duct has been divided. Oops. Uh, the superficial cystic artery, on your right has been taken. This shows the course of the right hepatic artery, which was stuck to the gallbladder for several centimeters before giving off the deep branch and then going up into the liver. I personally have taken as many as five cystic arterial branches from a right hepatic artery that went along the course of the whole gallbladder essentially before it reluctantly went back into the liver. 15% uh, of the time, the right hepatic artery or the common hepatic artery will come from the SMA in which course it's going to be located dorsal and lateral to the common duct, and it's usually the source of the cystic artery. There are some adjacent landmarks that are useful for staying on course during cholecystectomy. The first is the falciform. Uh, when I start a case, I often ask the resident to point to where they think the common hepatic duct is before we start any dissection. Not infrequently, someone will indicate this area. We pull back the camera and look at the plane of the falciform ligament. The falciform is between segments three and four. 
the common hepatic duct is in the midplane of the liver between segments four and five. So if you're close to the plane of the falciform ligament, you're way too far to the patient's left. Uh, Rouvier sulcus is a fissure on the right side of the liver where the right portal, portal pedicle enters, and you can see it in 75 to 80 percent of individuals. This marks the anterior posterior plane of the common duct, so the dissection must be anterior to the sulcus. Uh, the epicolodocal plexus produces a pattern of vessels on the outside of the common duct that can help distinguish its external appearance from that of the cystic duct. And finally, look at the relationship of any duct to the duodenum. A duct that goes directly behind the duodenum, like this, is the common duct. Uh, this picture is actually from a case of a bile duct injury where this common duct was mistaken as the cystic duct. So we reviewed bile duct anatomy that increases the risk of injury, namely separate right ducts, subvesical ducts, and cystic ducts that are hidden or short. We looked at arterial variations that increase the risk of vascular injury, variations in the cystic artery, right hepatic arteries that are close to the gallbladder, and landmarks, the falciform, stay well to the patient's right of it, Rouvier sulcus, stay anterior to it, and the epicolodocal plexus and the duodenum, stay away from them. Thank you.